I think I've introduced Roman already, but uh, another conference, but I'm going to do it again. I'm really glad to have him here. He is a missionary farmer in Lancaster, all right? So it's good to hear, good to hear uh, some things about how to farm here. So we're going to pray for Roman right now. Dear Lord, we thank you for this brother. I pray that you bless him, give him uh, words to speak, give us hearts, Lord, that are open. We know we've been listening and our ears are almost hurting with how much information, inspiration, encouragement, exhort exhortation is coming. But Lord, help us to stay open for one more round at least. And I pray that you bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you, brother. Thank you for that introduction, Mel, and for the prayer. Um, I have to say I see myself as a missionary to America. I would have liked to be in Haiti and like to be in Ghana and like to be uh, visited mission fields, but to hear reports from the field are very encouraging. But uh, I see myself as a missionary to American farmers, especially to my community, because my community is the worst for monocultures and tillage, both of which degrade soil, and I'll explain that further. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little story, and this is not to bring glory to myself, but we were, my wife and I were on a 10,000-mile trip across America visiting farms, mostly, and farmers we knew, and also meeting people we didn't know, and we were in uh, Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming, with David Martin, and I asked him, I said, we were headed for the Wolf Point Hutterite colony in northern Montana, and I asked him if there's a Anabaptist community that we could visit. I mean, I could visit the Baptist church or any church along the road, but I preferred visiting an Anabaptist community. And he thought for a little bit, and he started shaking his head, and then he said, yeah, there is one. There's about four hours away. It's in Gillette. And so uh, he said, you get on the road, I'll get you contact information, and I got contact information, and the fellow that I talked to was Joe Weaver, and he was from Lancaster County. And he knew, we knew each other from business and stuff. And, but uh, I said, is there a farmer in this community? And he said, yeah, there's one, Dennis Miller. So uh, I, he gave me Dennis's contact, and I texted him, and, and uh, a couple hours later, he texts back and said, sure, uh, we'd be, op I, I asked for a place to park our van. I didn't ask for food or a place for the night, but we, we have a van we could sleep in. We slept in it every night. And uh, so he invited us for pizza for supper. And well, that was welcome. And uh, so this was one of five Anabaptist churches we visited on our way, and mostly plain churches, I mean all plain churches, and uh, so that, that was an interesting little side gig, but a afterwards we had a uh, uh, fellowship dinner, and I sat beside somebody at the table, and he said, so you're Roman Stolzfus, are you the one that lives along Gap Road? And I said, I am. He said, well, I was at a uh, a meeting at your farm. About 15 years ago, or 20 years, and he said I was encouraged to be there. So that was good to hear that. And we have, since we started our journey in uh, organic and sustainable agriculture, we, we have uh, made it our mission to open our farm up for educational events, and we've had probably an average of one or two a year, where we had anywhere from 50 to 100 or 200 people there to uh, explore what can be done. But nothing changed the way we farm as much as what we learned about three years ago, two to two and a half to three years ago, at a understanding ag 
soil health meeting at, that day we had on our farm. I offered to have it because I knew that we'd learn the most if it was on our farm. We had about 50 farmers there. This is no free meeting. This, this meeting cost uh, 1350 a piece to attend. And we had, it was sold out. So afterwards, a young Amish neighbor came. We had farmed beside them all our years. And I didn't know what he thought of the way we farmed, but the young 17-year-old boy paid his own way to come to this meeting. And he told me afterwards that this meeting lit a fire under him. He wants to farm so bad he can taste it. So uh, I hope I can light a little bit of a fire under you. If you understand the principles and why tillage, how tillage and why monocultures destroy a community, it's really simple. There's two reasons. Monocultures are not nature's way. Neither is tillage nature's way. You never saw... Monoculture is a single crop, like soybeans or corn. Now, you can do polycultures row by row, side by side, and get a lot of advantage out of, out of that. Uh, so, but... We want to go over the six principles of soil health here and see where's my button here. Simply put, re, the reason monoculture and tillage destroy a community is because they militate against God's perfect design. Laws are in place that build soil or tear it down. Let's explore these laws. When soil's ability to regenerate is taken away from Farmers are forced off the land because it becomes unprofitable. When you do monocultures and tillage, every year your soil is going down. You're not improving your soil. Don't matter how much manure you apply, how much compost you apply. We already heard that about compost and manure and the over-application of both of those. Uh, it, you, you, when, when the prairie was first broken in the Midwest, they said you could hear it for miles, the tearing of the fungi and my mycorrhizal fungi, the tearing of this rope-like structure that went through the soil. They say there's, in, a, in an acre of healthy soil, there's 24,000 miles of mycorrhizal fungi growing in, in, in strings. I don't have a good picture of that, but just picture ropes buried under the soil. And these, these help the soil communicate in ways we don't even begin to understand yet. We, is what we understand about soil is very little. But aside from the owner, operator, or good steward, the soil's, soil is the farm's best and most precious asset. It will dictate whether you make money. Knowledge about soil is what makes the synergism of the caretaker God's design tick. It dictates whether that farm will make money for its caretaker this year or even more for future generations. Remember, profit is not always measured in dollars and cents or bushels and pounds. There are many unmeasurable benefits to proper management. Make sure we didn't miss a slide here. Um, so here are the six, another rather hard to be measured benefit is the holding capacity of the soil. Storing energy, enhancing soil energy flow is what healthy soil does best. So stewarding the soil and the community that soil is, is the goal. 
And for that to be done well, you need to understand the six principles of soil health. And I noticed in the talks from Haiti and Ghana and, and uh, Nigeria that these, these six principles were, were put, put in place. I mean, were, were used whether they realized it or not. Successful soil management is going to always entail these six principles, at least these six. And uh, these laws are in effect 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and literally will make you successful or poorer, depending on your understanding and harnessing of these principles. The six principles are, first of all, know your context, do not disturb. Now, know your context is a special one. That's a little bit more of a brain thing, which I don't do so well at. It's not as much hands-on. But the six principles of soil health, knowing your context in Nigeria and in Haiti and in Ghana are so important. You got to live while you adopt these principles. And sometimes you violate the principle to as a means to an end. It's not saying that tillage is never used. Tillage is always in your toolbox. And I'll show you some examples of unintended tillage later on. But do not disturb. You, nature never gives soil disturbance. Think about that. It always covers and builds surface armor. Nature is growing things. It's growing, and it's never growing monocultures. Never. You never see soil grow a field of beans, or a field of corn, or a field of alfalfa. Some farmers say that soybeans are the worst crop they plant. They, I heard one conventional 2,500-acre farmer say that he'll never plant another field of beans again because of the degradation that soil, that beans bring to his soil. And he had soil that was a higher percentile than mine, and he's not farming organically. He's just following some of these six principles, some of them. Uh, mix it up is the fourth principle, and we'll go over all of these some more. When I say mix it up, I mean bring disruptions, bring animals in, bring uh, animals is my favorite way to bring disruption. In fact, is it's probably the only safe way to do it. Keep living roots in the soil. That's that's another problem with monocultures. And tillage is that for periods of the year, for a couple months in the spring and a couple months in the fall, you have bare soil. And that's, that's a no-no. So you want to grow healthy animals and soil together. Let's, let's talk about these individually. Know your context. That means you know where you're at, what goals you want to accomplish and what, what it is that you're wanting to grow. Are you growing food for human consumption? Or are you growing food for animals? We have found success in growing food for animals, and that comes in the way of diverse pasture that becomes more diverse all the time. And then knowing your context, your goals, you, is your, our soil health practices are a reflection of ourselves and our stewardship of the land. They reflect what you know about your soil and help you. It, it, you need to have some knowledge to bring context to your relationship with your soil. Do not disturb. In nature, there's no mechanical or chemical disturbance. Fire is sometimes natural. Uh, yeah, we just 
went through a conference where we had Glen Elzinga from Idaho, which grazes 64,000 acres, 46,000 on, on public rangeland, and some of that burned. And he said it improved the soil. Uh, burning is not always bad. But, yeah, it needs to be used as a disruption and very carefully considered. So, but do not disturb. You let nature alone and massage it into submission. You massage it. You carefully handle nature and work alongside it, not against it. Not kill that bug. And you kill that bug, you kill a thousand beneficials. And you very much work against yourself when you kill that one bug. It's better for like vegetable croppers and people that have problem with bugs is to figure out what John Kemp said yesterday, figure out the micro imbalance that's happening in the soil and figure out companion cropping and figure out well, what he did with the strawberry experiment there. That was, that was interesting. And much more could have been done, and I'm sure much more is being done. Cover and build surface armor to protect the soil's skin. Soil is vulnerable when it's naked. It is vulnerable to washing away and to baking. Uh, even like a straw field, you take wheat off in the summer, and you can get temperatures of 120 to 140 degrees in a wheat field. And effective soil temperature is from 50 to, say, 75 ideal temperature range. And you will see where you have grass on, the amount of grass that you should leave in your pastures in the fall, you will see spiders moving around in there all winter long, even on the coldest days when the ground is covered with a foot of snow. You can dig down through the snow and find live bugs. I have seen it, and it's exciting. So you cover and build surface armor because soil isn't just about one thing. It's about a myriad of things, a myriad. We have... Even land where I thought we would improve on what my dad did in pastures, we tore them up, grew a tremendous corn for a couple years, and then we put it back in pasture after we learned our lesson. And we had, 10 years later, we had over 100 species. Now, there's people in the world that raise very fine racehorses, and they found out that they won't let a broodmare out on a pasture with less than 80 species. And a lot of my friends and farmers are seeing 100 to 140 species after 10 or 15 years of carefully managed grass. You mix it up. That's what I'm talking about. We. Okay, when this, this spring we were offered a farm for rent that was already organic, and it had soybeans on last. The whole thing was in soybeans, monoculture. And so we tilled it to get it level and smooth and planted it in about 10 different species of grass and legumes. Alfalfa being the main one, we're going to mostly make hay on that farm. But we're expecting many more species to join the foray and, and, and we'll give it some longer rest to get that done and put some livestock on it to get that done. That's the way we mix it up. Nature does not grow monocultures. Why should we? Mimic nature for success. Plants and animals were... Diversely created, wait a minute, did I miss a slide? Okay. Plants and animals were diversely created. 
the story of creation establishes a positive link between human agriculture labor and the spread of plants and herbs of the field. Human activity is expected to promote the land's ability to grow plants. Adam was not stupid. Okay, he didn't have a father to train him how to uh, do soil, but he had God and had a relationship with him. And I imagine that Adam planted diversity to aid plant growth. I'm sure he asked God, how can I steward this garden you put me in? He wasn't stupid. I also imagine that God's original planning was full of diversity. Same with the animal kingdom. I mean, you... There is so many species of plants and animals that we haven't even discovered all of them yet. And you want as many of those species that are native to your region to grow in your region. And what's so interesting and positive is, I'll show you some pictures later, where, where we grow the most diverse pasture, we have the most birds and the most insects and the most microbes and mycorrhizal fungi under the ground. So we keep living roots in the soil. Now, the way a regular crop farmer can do this is, is immediately, one thing that this large farmer that had better soil than mine did was when he was running his combine or chopper in the fall, he would run a drill behind that chopper or combine and be drilling in a cover crop, and usually a mixture of cover crops. And so then in the spring, he would take that off, put that away as silage, nuke the whole thing with Roundup. I know him, and I said he, he wasn't following us. <laughs> and plant corn, but he did amazingly well. The thing he didn't do, and the thing that Alan Williams, the teacher of this understanding ag class, told us, he said, if, if I could get that farmer, he's not far from here, if I could get him to do what you're doing with his animals, we could make some real progress. Grazing animals have been an essential component of all soils at one time or another. You know, I was taught in school that the glaciers came down from the north and pushed soil ahead of them and ground up rock and made topsoil. Nothing could be further from the truth. What made the topsoil was the buffalo herds, the wild animal herds, thousands more heavy wild animals were in the U.S. when Columbus discovered America than there are today. And nobody put any silage away for them. No one planted any corn. No one hauled any manure. No one made a TMR mix to make sure they were fed. Nature took care of that. Wolves chased. Uh, John Kemp talked about the wolves at Yellowstone Park. Well, there's, there's wolves in these areas to keep. To, I mean, there's an ecosystem that's in place that keeps things moving in a healthy direction. So you want to grow healthy animals and soil together. Here's a picture of our cows a few springs ago. This is, this is during the ideal time. This looks like a monoculture, but it's a certain time of the year in the spring. We love to see this, but it's unrealistic. We only see this for a couple weeks out of the year. And these cows are happy. And in an hour or two of grass like this, they'll be standing there punched out, really full. We love to see that. We watch for that, that fullness because a cow, a hungry cow, is an, is an unproductive cow. So this all... Regenerative agriculture is the new buzzword, regenerative. It's superseded sustainable and for sure organic, because what does that mean anymore? We have everyone claiming to be organic and sustainable and now regenerative. 
farming and ranching in synchrony with nature and the four ecosystem processes to repair, rebuild, revitalize, and restore ecosystem functions, starting with the life beneath the soil and extending to life above the soil. We use the 643 principle to accomplish this. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm here giving this talk this year, I feel, because I didn't do a good enough job last year. And uh, I tried to cover too much area, but I can't hardly talk about the six principles without talking about the four ecosystem processes. There's four ecosystem processes. There's energy flow. We have nothing to do with that. The sun provides energy, and it flows toward the earth. The water cycle, we have no control over rain, but we can greatly control what happens to that rain after it falls on our ground. And, our, and every farmer like ourselves is looking to keep every drop on the farm. And you will notice if you drive the roads during a thunderstorm, in our area that the field, the water coming off of our fields is clean. And then the mineral cycle. We cycle minerals from above ground to beneath the ground and back up again. And every time we do this, we encourage diversity. More diversity. So there's four ecosystem processes that we have very little to do with. But these are part of the system. And then there's the three rules of adaptive stewardship. And this is where Haiti and Ghana and Iraq and those places come in. You have compounding effects of every decision you made, compounding cascading effects of every decision you make on your farm will you, you can never make an isolated decision. It's like in a church. You do not make isolated decisions. You make a decision about something, but it will affect the rest of the body and affect everything that body does. So the compounding effect here of disruption and diversity. So we have... Uh, these effects are never neutral. They're never neutral. They're always else building or tearing down your soil. So a disruption, what does a disruption look like? That's like starting at a different place to graze this spring than you did last spring. It's like skipping a field because it just doesn't seem to be doing as well. So you skip it and go to the next field or the next paddock. And like you encourage diversity by, by giving it rest. Re we find rest to be one of the most important aspects of our type of farming and maintaining profitability. See here we turn cows into pasture grass that's as high as this table from the platform to the, to the table. And uh, we let them take about half. Maybe not even quite half. And you'd think, well, now that's too mature grass for a dairy cow, and they're going to lose production, and that was our biggest thing. But we found out that the, the taller grass is, the more there's a strata of grass in there that is right for them. Because even if it's 80 days since it was grazed last, it's growing an understory that they have to go to it to get. And when they get that, they get some of the coarser grass on top, and that actually helps their stomachs to work better. You might have got to remember, cows are a furnace. You, you basically have a, a fermentation vat on legs. Diversity is key to good soil, plant, and animal relationship. Diversity feeds soil microbes. Diversity is the fourth principle of soil health. The birds and insects love healthy soil. No-till cuts into the surface of the soil and breaks this webbing built by mycorrhizal fungi. We, we have, I told you about the mycorrhizal fungi, and we have this webbing that even no-till 
No-till works with disc openers and it cuts through the skin of the field. And it's better than brown ground farming. But it's not as good as letting animals do the work for you. Okay, here at the end of our driveway on the farm, we left a two-acre plot. You can see to the left of this plot um, where we managed it normally. And we left this from April 1st until November. And this picture was taken about September. And this is some grandchildren. We don't grow grandchildren in our fields. But we have some interested grandchildren looking for the soil life they can find there. I just hit the cable there a little bit. Uh, so this, during our soil class, we went out and we dug in this part, and we dug in the part beside it. And what we found was about eight inches of healthy soil in the green part, and about 12 inches of healthy soil in the part that looks like a weedy wheat field and smelled like one too. And the birds and the insects were just so prolific. It was just so amazing. So last year we did this normally again and we're watching it. But see, this increases biodiversity because it, when you rest ground like that, you allow the mycorrhizal fungi to go deeper and bring up some seeds that heretofore could not germinate because they didn't have the fertility to germinate. So you germinate these seeds by providing a healthy environment for them to grow. Soil microbes are the most powerful substance that fosters all of the life we know in soil. And we, what we really know about soil is little, but we know enough that tillage, aggressive, and monocultures are bad for soil because in the case of monocultures, mainly the lack of diversity. Diversity is everything in building a strong, healthy soil and resilience. It is a key component of healthy soil. Now here, what we do on our farm that's different is we raise all our calves on nanny cows. In other words, we put a cow in a pen with two or three calves, generally two, used to be three, but we found they grow better with two. And until they figure out that this is mama and this is my calf to raise. And we're actually using some of these nanny cows for the third and fourth year and they get good at it. They get easy to train. And they watch over this calf and graze side by side with this calf and teach it how to graze. It's amazing what calves can learn from cows instead of having them in a pen, which isn't legal by organic standards anymore. And we wouldn't want to if we could. We, we love this method. We grow, we keep the first 50 or 60 heifers that are born every spring in March and train them onto nanny cows and move, then move them on a pasture away from the farm which is not close to the milking parlor and there they spend their summer. Now, why, why would I mess with your warm fuzzies about tilling soil? The Bible refers to tilling the ground in a positive way, so why am I throwing cold water on your warm fuzzies? I don't know. I won't ask how many of you use a tiller in your garden. I don't want to know. <laughs> but a tiller is one of the most destructive things you can take near your garden. Now, they can be used judiciously in the spring if it's dry enough and you go fast enough and don't do a very nice job of tilling. But if you grind it up so that it's smooth and level on top, you just done killed a lot of your microorganisms and a lot of your worms, and it's just, just a bad idea. But what if a more accurate version of the word tillage is used in Scripture would be to steward the soil or massage it into usefulness? John talked about this 
yesterday, and I really liked what he had to say. This could mean living on and profiting from what grows. This is best done with permanent pastures and that are grazed with a variety of ruminants and monogastrics like pigs or chickens. Not everyone can have cows. Now, we, we do collect some manure from our cows, and this isn't a very good picture of our composting operation, but we mix our manure that we collect with old hay that we buy for cheap and turn it a couple times and turn it into compost and spread that on our off-farm off fields. We don't use it on our home farm because we have 240 cows and only 170 acres. It takes about three acres per cow to be self-sufficient. And that goes for any dairy, whether they're grain-fed or grass-fed, about three acres per cow. This is our central hub. Um, God took away some of our buildings and we replaced them because of fire. And, but we milk in the one to your far right there. Far left. To your left. And the rest are different uses around the farm. And then we have two turkey buildings where I raise some organic turkeys. Here is just weaned eight-month-old calves. Do any of you, can you approve of that? They are the healthiest things. They are just amazing animals. See the shiny hair coat? Uh, these are eight-month-old, and they barely notice when mom is taken away. Some people don't even wean anymore. They just... Let them alone. And eight months, eight months old. Yeah, these these are these are eight months old, just weaned, and they weigh about five hundred pounds. They they weigh good. And what what we're doing is every year when we truck them to the heifer farm in Juniata County, we uh, we found out it's easier to truck animals to feed and feed to animals. So these, these heifers this year, our group this year, this isn't this year's group, this is last year's group, have not had any stored feed all winter. In spite of snow, in spite of, well, they have not had any stored feed all winter. They learned to dig through the snow to get the grass. And we put them on where there was plenty of grass, like a grass, if you pulled it up, it would have been this tall some places. And they've lived on that all winter so far. We haven't needed to feed them any hay. And that is also got only grass? Right. The, no, the nannies, we give them some haylage and baleage through the summer because they are working hard. They milk. They milk a lot. Now, the last couple years, we've been grazing in the winter time, and sometimes you don't have the most ideal weather. So you see what happened here. We had three days of rain in the end of February when everything was soft and there was frost in the ground yet. So the water had no place to go, but we had no barn to put cows in and didn't want one. But we were a little aghast at what the tillage that was happening here. But guess what? This is not the same as plowing or tilling or chiseling or disking. It's much better. And here's the same picture a couple months later. More diversity. More everything. And we've been watching this field ever since. It's been two and a half years now since that rain event. And this has significantly outproduced the other fields on that farm. That's a 100-acre farm. And we only messed up about 10 acres, uh, hardly that. And that's what we got for it. We got more diversity and more yield. Each plant brings different properties to the soil strata. Each plant, for example, has its own root exudates, and John talked about that, that make different chemical properties available. How much time do I have yet? Okay. Make... Uh, 
chemical properties available in the topsoil layer. For instance, the blue corn flour pictured below, I have a picture of it, planted at a rate of 100 plants per acre will increase wheat yield by 10 to 15 percent. This is a powerful influence for such few plants per acre. How many thousands of wheat plants are there per acre? But a hundred of the blue corn flour. That's a, that's a picture of the blue corn flour. And you just mix that in with your seed and you get a candid demonstration of what a little bit of diversity will do for you. So even if you're a crop farmer and committing all the sins that I'm preaching to you about, you can begin to mitigate your ways by adding some diversity. One more study on diversity. Penn State study found in 2016 that comparing a two-species mix, grass and legume, just grass and alfalfa, to a five-species mix, the planting yield 31% greater in the five-species blend over a nine-year period. How do you like that for payoff? But, oh, but you didn't have your beautiful, clean alfalfa field that my wife still admires when we drive past. <laughs> I say, that's a Roundup field. That's Roundup ready alfalfa sprayed with Roundup. That's the way it stays so clean. Now, when my wife and I were out west, we saw, we visited a, an organic farmer in Michigan who had a brother who did 5,000 acres of, of uh, regular farming. And they did primarily black beans and soybeans and corn, and, and they were harvesting black beans. But in the, in the field beside where they were harvesting black beans, they had a sprayer going. What's that sprayer doing? He's spraying Roundup on the beans. On the beans. That's an extra label that's not in the label for Roundup. But if you buy black beans that aren't organic, you're going to get some Roundup with them, most assuredly. The reason they do that is that kills all the beans and makes them go through the combine better. Yeah, and they do it to wheat, and they do it to oats, and they do it to a lot of crops. It's just, it just makes you scratch your head. Oh, it's just such a shame. So here, here we, we, this is my last slide, or one of the last. This was this winter. We had this 70-acre field that we wanted to cover and bale graze on. Now, we left it go from, this is the field where the nannies raised their calves. We moved them off, moved them down to the farm where we did the damage in the spring, and we grazed them during August for a disruption. And then we moved the dry cows and heifers, which was a 200-head group. We dry off 100 dry cows, 120 dry cows in January, about the 15th. And we mixed, brought our heifers in, pregnant heifers, mixed them with. And so we had a, r roughly 200 cows there. And they, they had to dig through the snow. Now, they, they, we fed them hay also. But they were getting about half of their feed from grass, about half. We, we, we did, deducted that from moving them to a field where there was no grass, and we immediately had to double our hay feeding from four bales to eight bales. So, but do you think do you, do those cows look healthy to you? They look healthy to me. And clean, no manure to scrape after them. In fact, the manure is going, dropping right on the ground where it can do the most good. And we would have liked to see more soil disturbance here. We would have loved to have some rain during this time. Some rain, okay? <laughs> we didn't want to destroy it all. But we would have loved to have some rain. But we didn't get that. Imagine the diversity that we can get in a pasture that is grazed properly for years and years when given proper rest and management. Plants grow that have medicinal value and animals can actually self-medicate. 
Since we started on our grazing journey and learning how to steward soil, we have much less milk fever and unhealthy cows. We had one milk fever case in 100 freshenings this spring. One milk fever case. And that cow jumped up and was good to go. We pulled no calves. That's unheard of for the size operation that we run. So are there, there are two ways that community suffers with poor management. One is the soil and the other is the community. When, farmer, when a farmer can no longer support working the farm and has to take an off-farm job because of poor producing soil and management. We are farming, I am farming, I have been farming for 40 years for the next generation. I hope they have something more to pass on than I got. I got more from my dad than was passed on to him. When he got the farm, when my grandpa bought the farm in 1941, during the war, he paid 17,000 for 200 acres, 230 acres, and there was ditches in the middle of that farm. You could have driven a tractor down through the ditch and not been able to be seen from the land beside it. It was farmed out. He got all the equipment, all the cows, and the young stock, horses included, with that deal for 17000 And my dad says that's all it was worth. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> That's what I have to share. I'm open for some questions. Do you have any idea about the mechanism of why that mud lot was not as destructive as tillage? Is that just... Is yeah. Like uh, partly because of the way a cow... A hoof action in the soil is different from a tractor track, for instance. A tractor track impedes energy flow across that track just because it's sunk down in the mud. And a disc is even worse. You just destroy it. All soil relationships are affected with tillage, almost any kind of tillage, including no tillage, which is not really no till. It's minimum till. A minimum till is better than full till. But yeah, no, that's, that's what we can... We, we, and, and then the manure, the manure that was pushed in there with that. Now what we did there on that land is we ran a no-till drill over it, which helped to level it. We did it mostly to level it, but we figured while we're running the no-till drill over it, we might as well throw some seed in. So we did. And the first year, that seed barely expressed itself. But the second year is amazing. And, and it's only getting better from here. So, yeah. No. You said how the no-till is better than ground and land. I understand that. But the downside of no-till is the extra chemical corrosion. Right. Yeah, the, the question or the comment was that I said that no-till is better than brown ground, and he understands that, but what about all the chemicals that are being used? Well, there is some no-till that's organic, but it, it, it also increases the amount of tillage that you need because you, you really need to cultivate between those rows of corn and beans, and they have a no-till cultivator that can do that, but that loosens the soil and makes it susceptible to erosion. And erosion, soil is really what's causing the dead zone probably more than the chemicals, but chemicals have, a, have an effect as well. Okay, so the question is, um, how, how does it happen that we have more diversity as time goes on? That's easy to explain because the mycorrhizal fungi are never messed up. 
I mean, even, even the cows tramping didn't tear those underground ropes as much as tillage would have. That's one thing. And also, um, see, the second question was, oh, what good are the insects? Well, the insects, I don't understand everything about an insect, but I'm told that the birds, and I would, I would like to have Raphael speak to this. He said, spray in the afternoon. I heard spray in the morning because that's when the birds have opened the stomata of the plant. The birds singing open the stomata of the plant is what I heard. At least that's the way they do in North America. I don't know about Africa. <laughs> but so I would say early morning would probably work just as well as afternoon, but I don't know. We'll, we'll have to experiment with that and see. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the question was, what, why did we run the no-till drill after the cows messed it up? Uh, that was mostly to level the soil. It was not at all to uncompact it. Because, okay, we didn't get as much compaction there because the frost was still not out of the ground. And, I mean... We think the churning of the hoof action, I mean, a disruption is, that, that's a classic case of an unintended disru disruption, but kind of intended. You, you want some of that, and yeah, you, you, you just find that disruptions are not all bad, unless you do them with a tractor. Some, someone asked yesterday if... Uh, how you can get compaction out of soil like in Iraq. And John's answer, remember what he said, was iron. Well, we have that piece of iron. We have a five-row subsoiler that cuts a slot about 13 or 14 inches deep every 30 inches. And we use that very carefully sometimes, but less and less. I imagine that machine is for sale because we just see that healthy soil will uncompact itself. Question in the back. Yes, yes, uh, so the comment was, uh, about carbon in the soil. How much carbon are we putting in? Well, we're putting in the maximum amount. And that goes in through the cycling of nutrients. And we actually are getting paid for some of that. The milk company that we are now sh going to ship to starting July 1 has, has uh, a payment that they're making for farmers that they pay according to what they do. Now, we plant trees. One of our pictures had pictures of cows on it with trees in the background. We, we are planting trees on a lot of our day pastures for shade for the grass and for the cows. And, and trees have a mycorrhizal fungi relationship with soil that really helps. And that, that is good for 60 feet or 30 feet, 30 feet. They can reach out into the, into the soil around them 30 feet. So we plant our rows 60 feet apart, partly because we had a machine that mowed pasture and it was 30 feet wide. So it's kind of ridiculous. We never mow anymore. We hardly ever mow anymore. OK, I think my time's up. I'll take one more question. Okay, we don't make the most perfect compost. The question was about the ingredients in our compost. Uh, we, we do hay, manure, 
and we do two different kinds of manure, turkey manure and, and cow manure. And then we do clay. Uh, we, we have a highly siliceous clay that we mix with. You don't want to mix sand with our topsoil because topsoil has a crystal and a sand, sand has crystals and you want to form your, your compost structure on a clay molecule and they're much smaller. But anyway, and we mix straw, straw and hay and manure, about five or six different ingredients and if we have something we got for free, sometimes some, someone has some rained on hay that they want to give us, we'll take that and add that in with the better hair. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for your attention.